You guys interviewing Marines and Air Force and everyone? Yeah. So you're going to compile? Right Hello, my name is Wade Fisher. Today's date is November 16th, 2009. I am interviewing Mr. Ron Lahode at Ball State University about his experience in the military during the Vietnam War. Thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up? I grew up on a dairy farm in the northern part of the state called Hebron, Indiana. And right next door to Hebron was a little school called Boone Grove, and that's what I graduated from. All 12 grades in the same block building. And graduated in 1963, freshman year at IU, uh, got put on probation academically, came back home to Muncie, or to uh, Hebron. Uh, my dad saw that the dairy farm was too big, I did, and I hated it at the time. So he f moved to a little town called Gaston, just north of here, and bought a slaughterhouse, got involved in the meat business. So my second year in college was at Ball State. It was still on quarters. Went first quarter, winter quarter, spring quarter, 1966, I quit. And uh, just as soon as I quit, I got drafted from my draft board in Valparaiso, Indiana, which is the, the, the county seat of, Delaware, of uh, Porter County. And uh, I joined the Marine Corps. And the only reason I joined the Marine Corps was I have a cousin that I looked up to all the time, and he was a former Marine. So I uh, got in the Marine Corps, got out in 68, and uh, went back to Ball State, graduated in 1970 <clears throat> with a BS in business, and uh, worked for my parents up until, or with my parents up until 1980 in the meat business. My dad retired. I went on to work in the industry, uh, worked in Dallas, Texas, worked in Upper New York, and then uh, 82 to 86, I worked in the in the Alaska, I started Alaska's first USDA meat plant and left Alaska in 86, came back to Muncie because uh, my parents were here and got in home remodeling. And the last 22 years I was in the home remodeling business. And the building that my meat business is in now uh, came empty uh, last January, the downstairs. So I'm getting too old to lift drywall sheets and drywall buckets of mud, etc. So that my, was my last remodeling job, and I started the meat business again. And here we are. Did you have any other family members beside your husband? I, ha I have one sister, and she lives in Upper New York. She's a Ball State graduate, and her husband is a Ball State graduate, and one of her three kids is a Ball State graduate. Did you have any other family members who served in the military? Uh, my brother-in-law, I only have the one sister, he spent 36 years in the uh, Air National Guard flying C-130s all over the world, and he retired as a bird colonel. When, what time period did your cousin serve? I beg your pardon? What time period did your cousin serve in the Marines? Uh, Wally was in the Marine Corps probably uh, 1958 to 1960, maybe, in that area. See. So what were you feeling when you were drafted? Well, I'd always heard how the Marine training, how much more superior it was than the Army or the Air Force or the Navy. I don't know if that's true, but um, when I got drafted in the Army, and a little afterthought there. I don't know if they do this today, but I didn't report to my draft board. And I have it hanging up in my in my den at home, a letter that they sent me saying, you were noted for it of your draft, you didn't report. If you don't report to this draft board in 10 days, we will send the proper authorities out to get you. Isn't that something? So anyway, um, I was already in the Marine Corps. But I went in, I suppose, because of... I guess the training and what my cousin had talked about, uh, how well he was trained. So I thought, well, if I'm going to go overseas, I'm going to go with supposedly the best. And that's why I joined the Marine Corps. And I'm glad I did. Can you describe for me what, what your experience was in boot camp? 
boot camp is, I think, a different experience for everyone that goes in. To me, it was a huge shock. Um, I grew up in a little small farming community. There weren't any blacks, there weren't any Mexican, or there weren't any Chinese. And uh, my platoon of 86 had maybe 20 blacks, half a dozen Chinese, uh, and then all walks of, of nationality of Americans in it. And um, you were absolutely petrified, <laughs> probably for the first three weeks. I mean, it is such a shock to your system and to your mind. What did you do? And I remember being there about there about 10 days or so, maybe two weeks, and we finally went to church. And I'm Catholic. And uh, it was a huge auditorium, and it was packed. The priest came out there and said, you just got to remember one thing. So many millions of troops went before you. If they can do it, you can do it. And that's what got me through the Marine Corps, through boot camp. Is I thought, boy, if that guy can do it, I can do it. And uh, as the months went by, it got a little bit easier because you understood what they were trying to teach you. You, if a Marine would, uh, a superior would tell you to do something, you did it. You didn't ask questions. You just did what he requested. If he wanted you to uh, jump inside a Coke bottle. You knew you couldn't get in there, but you sure in hell tried like hell to get in it. See, um, I look today at uh, well, people that work for me uh, question things that you do. They they uh, don't do things when you want them to do it. It's, it's when they feel like it. Um, boy, in the Marine Corps, you don't do that. And uh, someone tells you you jump too, and everywhere you went in boot camp, I don't care where it was, we ran. Ran to the mess hall, ran to the bathroom, ran to here. Just, we would run everywhere we would go. So, uh, and your your life was controlled from the time you got up to the time you went to bed. There was someone telling you what to do. And uh, consequently, uh, when I got out of the Marine Corps, um, you looked at life a lot different than you do if you didn't go into the service. So if I had anything to do with our government, everyone, in, uh, male or female, would go into the military. Not public service, uh, none of that Mickey Mouse stuff. You go into the Marines or the Navy, the Army or the Coast Guard or the Air Force. Serve two years, three years. We wouldn't have the problems that we have today uh, with, with young kids. So, um, I think Sweden does that, and I know Israel does that. They have it's mandatory out of, out of high school. Boom, going to the service. Is there any particular experience that sticks out in your mind? Oh, there's a lot. A lot of things stick out in my mind. Um, I go fishing with one of the fellows that I was in the training at the same time I was, but in a different platoon. But he was stationed at the same duty station, and we've become we we're lifelong friends. And uh, we just, every fall, we go out on a fishing trip. For, uh, my brother-in-law, he's in Air Force. My best buddy here is Navy, and then my buddy from the Marine Corps. And we'll talk about things that happened in boot camp that you, you forgot about, and then you sit back and you laugh about it. Uh, what stands in my mind is how shocked we all were about how you were treated. From the minute you got off the airplane, there was a DI standing there. He didn't care what he said in front of who, and he didn't care how big you were. He would tackle if he, tackle you if he had to. I don't know about that about today, but I remember got us in the in the green Marine Corps bus. We're all sitting there. He, he said, waiting for other planes to come in. Now you guys sit here and shut up. Well, you get a lot of guys that are smart asses and think they're going to do something big and, and talking. Um, and at that time. Uh, the Marines, they didn't, the DIs didn't hit you, but they would sure push you around. So they'd push you out of the seat and maybe put their foot on top of your chest and say, no, I told you to shut up. And of course, you, then you all got petrified. And then it was that kind of a treatment 
halfway through boot camp. Um, another instance was we got in Quonset huts, and there must have been maybe 10, 12 Marines to a Quonset hut, and they're all in a long row. And uh, you assign your rack. I was the upper bunk, and you strapped your you locked your rifle to the to the uh, iron railing, and you had your foot locker, which is a big wooden box with a padlock. And uh, the first night there, we got our showers, we got our haircut, we got all of our clothing, and mailed our clothing that we that we wore there back home the first night. We also got our linen, which was our uh, sheet, pillow, blanket, and uh, the term then was called a fart sack, which was a, a mattress liner. You put your mattress inside this white thing. I guess it was for sanitation purposes. We got all our gear, put it in that huge fart sack and threw it over our shoulder, and we're in yellow, t yellow sweatshirt, green uh, shorts, and flip-flops. And we're kind of in in rows, and they marched us out to our Quonset hut. And we got to California, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the evening. By 4.30, we were already in our in our uh, Quonset huts. And I remember one guy mouthing off. D.I. shoved him clear across the Quonset hut. He got back up, started to mouth off, shoved him again. Um, I would assume that... If, the, if they would strike the, the DI, the DI would probably knock them unconscious. But I put the fear of God in everyone. Another time, got to lock your foot locker. So you hurry up when the when um, Reveille, uh record came on, you could hear it. You had so many minutes to get up, get dressed, make your bed, and get out on Platoon Street and have your wall locker, your foot locker locked. Tell you once maybe tell you a second time. Third time, go back, D.I. would walk in there to, just to check things and hear your wall lock, your foot lock is unlocked. Boom. You're, out, you're standing out on Platoon Street all at this time. Here comes the MPs and you don't see the guy. They pick him up. And it must have been a day later, two days later, we're learning how to march and we stop, uh, make a uh, left face and come at ease. And, of course, we only can look straight and a little bit when you're at ease to the left and right, but you can't move around. And you're looking straight ahead, and here comes the guy that was in your platoon, that, or your, yeah, your platoon, and he's pushing a wheelbarrow up a hill full of concrete, and he's carrying a 16-pound sledgehammer and two canteens of water. So he did that for like two days, maybe, because he didn't lock his foot locker. So, boy, after that, man, I ran back in every five seconds to double-check, make sure everything's locked, because I sure in the heck didn't want to get in trouble. And then the thing that struck me funny, too, was when we got got second month, we were starting to learn uh, guard duty. Well, my guard duty was uh, going to a specific Quonset hut, getting this this uh, kid up, and making him, every, and I the guard duty was four-hour shifts. So for four hours, I got him up every hour, make him go to the bathroom. He had to pee at least one drop, then I'd go back to bed. So he got up those four hours. Well, then I would go to my Quonset hut and go to sleep, and another Marine would take over. He was a bedwetter, and he thought he could get out of the Marine Corps by wetting the bed. So the Marine says, fine. So after two days of this, no sleep, and then, when you, and then the next morning, go to your platoon and do your training, he wasn't a bedwetter anymore. Now, I don't know about today if that if they still do that, but, um, uh, you know, we're such pansies that, you know, today somebody's probably right their congressman and they have to stop that. And then another thing that really struck my mind that was just barbaric, it was uh, degrading, but it taught you a big lesson. You were so afraid to speak to the drill instructors. I hope Jerry Griffin told you this too. And there was a certain way you spoke to them that like the first 
four or five days, you had to go to the bathroom so bad. And you're standing out on Platoon Street or you're on this huge 100-acre grinder that's nothing but concrete and you're learning how to march. And you've got to go to the bathroom, but you're afraid to even raise your hand to talk to a drill instructor. Of course, if you're in maneuvers, you can't. But when he's giving instructions on how to march or something, you can... I can't remember how, what it all it is. It's, you, you yell out at somehow, drill instructor, private so-and-so, request permission to speak to the drill instructor, sir. And you're at attention. And, uh, you know, he would say, you know, speak maggot or something worse than that. And, uh, sir, uh, private Lahoti requests permission to go to the bathroom. And then, of course, they'd really get on you for saying the bathroom. You had to say the head. So um, that never happened. Everyone was so petrified to, for fear of getting in trouble that when we would come to attention and march off, he'd see puddles of water. So then he, I remember him stopping the platoon and said, look, we're going to have a bathroom break now, say at 10 o'clock in the morning. Then I can't remember what they did for lunch if you had a bathroom break then, and one in the afternoon. So well, that's great. So here comes, let's say it was at 10 o'clock in the morning, they take 86 guys, which was in my platoon. First rank, hit the head. And you, of course you ran. So you run like hell to the bathroom, and you just get in the bathroom, second rank, go. So here you got 40 some guys running to the bathroom and you get in the bathroom and it was nothing but commodes on one side, urinals in the center, and then the other side of the room was commodes all along the wall and commodes in the center. So if you had to sit down and use the john, you only had like 15 of them on each side and you got 40 guys. What do you do? So the first guys in, you really fight to get to the toilet. So you get in the bathroom, you just sit down, here come the DI. Get out, get out! Everybody just stop whatever you're doing, pull your pants up, get back out on the platoon street and attention. I'm thinking, my God, you know. So as time went on, like the first month or so, um, you fought that. Then you learn later on at night when you got on the guard duty, maybe that was the second month, that you could sneak out, walk behind the other other people who were already in guard duty training and you'd slip around them and you'd go to the bathroom and you'd do your business there and relax. Uh, otherwise, it was first come, first serve, hurry up, go, and get out. And, and all of this training was, uh, you know, if you're, if you're in a firefight, are you going to stop and hold it? i got to go to the bathroom. See? So, uh, you know, or if you're in a firefighter, are you going to stop and question your, your commander? You do what he says. I mean, it's just the way it is. And that all that was is they played mind games with you. Um, you know, it was always a mind game, something going on uh, during the day. Um, we had to get spinal meningitis shots. And uh, stand there in line, and that wasn't a shot or an air shot in your arms. It was an actual needle in your rear end, and it's a big needle. It's, it's thick serum, so you walk with your 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 pants and drawers dropped down, and you duck walk in a row. Corman's down there and gives you this big ass shot, and uh, get out on the platoon street and you exercise, and they'll exercise you till you almost drop to get that serum worked into your system. So the first guy out, or the first 40 guys out were really the ones that suffered like hell because uh, they were exercising this whole time. And that was another funny thing. Um, today, you know, you're a basketball player, a football player in high school or college or whatever, and you do 30 push-ups or you do 40, try doing 500. I mean, you do push-ups constantly. You do squat thrusts constantly uh, and that was a way of punishing the platoon you're marching some man is scratching himself the DI sees this he'll stop the platoon give me 50 squat thrusts get back up 
go again, some other guy does it. Well, finally, after a while, other Marines that see this guy doing this will get after him. You know, we're tired of this doing push-ups or squat thrusts because you want to scratch yourself. So uh, as it went on, it became easier and easier because everybody knew, you know, if you, you didn't do what you were supposed to, the whole platoon suffered for it. And uh, um, funny how I can remember, there's a guy from, his name was Onito, from a little tiny, tiny guy, Italian guy from some area in Brooklyn, New York, and he was a big offender. Could not obey an order, always moved, and we constantly did push-ups. And uh, finally, someone beat the living hell out of him because uh, he was in his Quonset hut, and that stopped it all. And then another time, I remember we were just had supper, had our shower, and we're in our white t-shirt shorts with flip-flops out, and we're sitting out on Platoon Street on a bucket, polishing our boots or something. Somebody did something. D. I said, okay, put your helmet on, put your uh, uh, cartridge belt on, your, your combat boots, uh, and your green shorts, and the backpack, we're going for a hike. So there we are, all cleaned up, ready for bed. And we would run five, six miles around somewhere. I don't, God only knows where. And um, we had a huge, huge black man. Thought he was going to take the DI on. So I think this was one of the reasons we went out in the middle of nowhere marching. And so the DI stopped. We're all at ease. And he's, his name was Sergeant Stride. This a little dinky guy. And, uh, of course, these guys are pristine in hygiene, and their clothing is just immaculate. So he takes off his smoky and took off his super starched pressed shirt. And there he is in that beautiful, clean, white T-shirt. Called the guy up and says, you know, you've been yakking that you want to take me on. Let's have it. So he undressed himself. Says, "Come on, buddy, we're gonna we're gonna go after it." And uh, guy was so petrified, he probably peed his pants. And there was another guy. One was a white guy and one black guy. Huge men that were smart, Alex. And this little guy said, "Come on, you know, you're either gonna do what I say or we're gonna have it out right here." And uh, once they pushed these guys so far, they all chickened out. They weren't as big as they thought they were. And um, today, after you got a boot camp, when you look back on it, you, know, you had a 50-50 chance of beating the hell out of him. Is this as well as the next guy? But your mind was so set that, you know, here's this mountain of a DI that can do no wrong and is so big and strong that you're really afraid. And, uh, as time went on, that got into your system too, that now you're a Marine, you know, you're not gonna let anybody push you around on and on and on. And uh, it's part of their, their, their training, I guess, you know. So, um, I mean, I could go on forever on a lot of little tiny stories, uh, um, but um, it was just a mind game that you did what they said, when, and you never had a moment's uh, peace to yourself. You were always controlled, always doing something. So the three months went by in a heartbeat. Just went by in a heartbeat. Went so quick. You said they would refer to you as terms such as maggot? Oh, all kinds of nasty words. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I use the one term today, shitbird, all the time. But that's that's not bad. But uh, I mean, they could really call you some foul names. Um, Talking about different stories, we had the squad leader. There was four, or yeah, there was four squads. I guess you want to call them that. I can't remember anymore. But they were the first guy in your in your row of Marines that marched. And he was a great big, huge white guy. And the DIs actually lived in these Quonset huts, so their office was in the front, and their little bunk and stuff was in the back. 
And they lived and slept with you for maybe a week on and a week off. I can't remember anymore, but I remember we had Sergeant Stride, a real disciplinarian, uh, no, a Sergeant Wilson, a real disciplinarian black guy, stocky and short, mean as hell, but real fair. I preferred him over the his boss who was black and then the other little white guy, Sergeant Stride. Sergeant Wilson was a fair guy, but mean. So if you were sitting out on Platoon Street doing something after training hours and he'd yell for you, you know, Private Lahoti. So you, you'd best hear him. And so they'd all yell down, Lahoti, you know, you, boy, you'd get up and you'd run. Uh, I can't remember how you, what the terminology was about something about Sir Private Lahoti, Sir coming or something, I don't know. And then you'd come to this big wooden door on the side of this round Quadson hut at the end, and you'd hit it three times as hard as you could. And if you didn't hit it hard enough, if you just tapped on it, you know, like a wimp, he, I can't hear you, and then you'd hit it some more. Well, if you didn't hit that door hard enough, give me 50 push-ups or some kind of crappy detail duty or something. Well, one time this big white guy, they called him, so uh, he went up to that door and he hit the door so hard he smashed it right in. And at that set the DI off. Boy, you're a good Marine. Of course, they never called you a Marine at all until you graduated. But that put a good light in that guy's mind about this, Mar this up and coming Marine because he smashed that wooden door down. I don't know who the hell fixed it, but uh, the DI kept saying, now, this is what all you girls should be doing, knocking my door down. But uh, and we never did. He just did it the one time. But he was so big. I bet he was 250 pound guy. You know. So anyway. What happened after boot camp? Uh, boot camp. Uh, we we all got our. What is it called? Uh, MOS, military occupational specialty. So that was what your job was going to be in the Marine Corps. So it's all by numbers. So I was an 0141, which meant I was a clerk typist. Don't ask me how you get that ranking. Um, I knew how to type. I had typing tests going into the Marine Corps. They tested you somewhere along the line, so maybe that had something to do with it. Um, or you could be an 0300, which is a grunt, a field foot soldier. And uh, that you didn't have any say so about it. They just handed it out. Here's what you are. So you graduated in the afternoon, and they gave you all of the, all your uh, your classification work classifications, and then uh, you had like two hours to see your your mother or father if anyone would come over, and then you were trucked somewhere in California because I was a Hollywood Marine, and we went to our second ITR training, and. Uh, there, we were confined to the barracks at night, and we and I, I think we could leave the base on the weekend with a pass. So you were still controlled; you just couldn't run free. And um, at that, I can't remember correctly, but I think at that time is where we learned. Uh, you know, how to walk by a tank or something, um, firefighting. Um, we all had to pass a, a, a vigorous swimming um, test, which I couldn't do. So every morning, in the uh, early morning, I got up and there was a, another Marine that was, you know, already a corporal or something that was showing lots of guys, here's what you have to do. And um, we had to be able to tread water with our clothes on and combat boots for so many half an hour, hour or something, it was damn tough to do. And then we had to swim so many laps at this long pool, so I, I finally passed that. And then we got out of that second advanced training and we went directly straight to a school that we were uh, assigned to for our job in the Marine Corps. So I went to clerical school. And I think that took six weeks. So we learned all about all of the how to type a Marine Corps 
uh, order, uh, how to type a regular Marine Corps letter, how to file the system, the whole nine yards. And then after that was done, um, I want to say we went home on boot leave. So went home on boot leave, came back, and I think we went through some other kind of training for overseas. Can't remember anymore. What does ITR training mean? Individual, IT, individual training regiment, I think. Something like that. So anyway, got everybody got assigned uh, Westpac, Western Pacific, which at that time was everything Vietnam. So um, we got all our gear, and we're going to start loading the boats. And uh, this was on Labor Day weekend, and myself and four or five or six other guys didn't have orders to go. So I went to the first sergeant and said, hey, what do we do? Well, you've got to stay in the barracks until Tuesday and come see me. We'll see what happens. So we sat in Oceanside, California on the beach the whole Labor Day weekend. And uh, Tuesday morning, reported to the first sergeant. He had our orders. And we made our way to San Francisco from San Diego from San Francisco to Treasure Island, or Travis Air Force Base, a little farther north, and we flew uh, to Westpac, or we flew to uh, Hawaii. We didn't take troop transport ship, which everybody in my platoon, uh, in training platoon and all that, everybody took transport ship to Vietnam. So we're just goofball kids, don't know what or where to go. They're telling you what to do. So I got off the plane in, in Hawaii to, at Honolulu, and there was uh, probably a corporal or a lance corporal. Uh, saw all of us young kids with no stripes, no nothing, and a manila envelope in our hand, and corralled us up and threw us behind this uh, pickup truck or jeep or something, and we went across the island to Marine Corps Air Station in Kaneohe. And uh, I'll never forget, uh, first time on a jet, first time to Hawaii, first time out of the country, and to see those islands with that huge uh, volcanic mountains all green and we're circling it to land and then go through the mountains and got on that Marine Corps Air Station and uh, all the lawns are manicured and the sidewalks are etched perfectly. Everything was clean. I thought, oh my God, what is this, paradise? So uh, w w they uh, escorted us up to, he to the headquarters long hallway, big L shape, at park benches, and there we sat, and we probably sat an hour. And finally, uh, I remember a staff sergeant came out and said, who can type? Well, we all could type. At, we didn't know it at the time, but we all were there, all were 0141 uh, clerk typists. So I stood up and said, oh, I can type. So he says, you know, come with him. So I went in and he interviewed me and then he was a staff sergeant, and then uh, the man, head man of the office, Major Bowman, interviewed me, and they cut my orders, and I stayed right there. And every one of us that were sitting on those park benches, every one of us, orders were stopped, and we stayed right there. We didn't go to Vietnam. Evidently, they needed clerks there, and uh, we uh, spent the rest of the tour right there in Hawaii. Hated every minute of it. Uh, because we didn't like the Marine Corps, uh, we wanted to be where the action was, and here we're stuck in paradise. And it must have been about a week later, here comes my platoon uh, on the troop transports right to Kaneohe, and they refueled there. So we went, ran down there, said hi to everyone, and they jumped in and all went on the Westpac, and we were, we were uh, orders were stopped right there. So it was all pre-planned. They, they knew that they needed uh, replacements for the clerks there in that headquarters office, and we happened to be at the right time. So all I did throughout the whole tour of duty was uh, I uh, would give a cup of coffee to a, uh, an off Marine Corps officer coming 
back from Westpac going to the mainland. And I'd retype, I'd cut his orders to wherever they were supposed to go and give them to the uh, major. He'd sign them and off that officer would go. So that's all I did. And then I, I kept the total strength and I did write uh, Marine Corps orders on the base, um, you know, all kind of clerical work like that. But mainly was uh, a clerk typist. My boss, Sergeant Floyd, could type 129 words a minute on a manual uh, Remington typewriter. I could get up to about 100, but I, I couldn't do it any faster than that. So today, I assume it's all computer, no more typewriter. <laughs> If you had to go back, would you take that job again, or would you have gone over to Vietnam? Um, at that time, if I had my druthers, I was prepared to go with the platoon to Vietnam. See, but uh, um, you know, on hindsight now, you know, um, hell, I could have been killed over there. I don't know, see, or wounded really bad. Did you have interaction with the troops that came back on their R and Rs? Uh, no, because uh, if I want to say those those uh, Marines that would come back on R and R didn't come to didn't go to Hawaii. I think they went to Okinawa, um, maybe Japan, but they didn't uh, come to Hawaii. Did you hear any stories coming back from Vietnam? No, not much. Um, you know, being just a corporal, you don't interact with a with an officer. Um, and if you got an officer coming th through your your office, uh, you just can't chit chat with him. I mean, he's way up here and you're way down here, and it's just you just don't do that. See. Um, now, the man I worked for, Major Bowman, uh, he, he didn't give you a lot of leeway, but I mowed his lawn for him on base, and uh, uh, he would uh, make tuna salad sandwiches for me uh, when I mowed his lawn just to do something different, see. So, uh, you know, he was kind of a friend as time went on, and then he retired, and uh, I corresponded with him for four or five years, and he, then he died or something, and time has gone on, but... Uh, uh, no, you don't talk too much to uh, the officers that were coming through. Um, like I say, they are in a, they're in a different zone than what an enlisted man is. Did you ever handle or type any sensitive material? Oh, I typed all kinds of top secret stuff, you know, um, in which I was surprised the military uh, once you got that job, um, I remember people writing me a letter saying, hey, you know, there's FBI guys who were walking around and asking all kinds of questions about you at school and at uh, where I was now and living with my folks in, in Gaston. And so I was surprised that they did do some kind of background check on you at that time even. See, So uh, I had a top secret clearance, but I didn't have, there was one more above that, some super, super top clearance, which I didn't have. Um, and I don't know why I would have had to have that kind, but uh, yeah, we had all kinds of supposedly top secret stuff come through that we had to have a clearance on in order to type something to, to go along with it. See, so yeah. What type of, of secret stuff did you come across? Oh, gee, I can't remember anymore. Um, a lot of it was aviation fuel because we were on an air. We were on an air. Um, it was a Marine Corps air station. A lot of it was, uh, um, I just remember a lot of it was aviation fuel, where it was going and where it was coming from and how it was stored. Um, I don't know what the big deal, why it was top secret, but it was. And uh, that just, there was other things, ammo maybe, but mainly fuels, what sticks in my mind that uh, was one of the top secret things. So no, nothing like, you know, when we're going to attack someone or anything, no. Of course, the building that I'm in, um, that I was was in, is still standing today, and it was, the Marine Corps Air Station was a big naval base, evidently during World War II, 
have rows and rows and rows of concrete three-story barracks. And uh, it was all Navy. And at the end of these two rows of, of, of uh, barracks, there was the headquarters office sitting in a nice, beautiful area. And at Christmas time, since I worked for all officers, they would invite us up to the war room. And it was, a, you took us, we only went up there uh, at, during holiday times. And um, it was the third floor. And it was, had windows here and there, but it had wall, walls full of maps that they could slide that were huge, you know, four foot by eight foot maps that they could slide all over and had a huge table in one area. And they called it the war room. So somebody was planning stuff, I guess the Navy was, from that room. And uh, we, would, we went up there. The officers invited the, all their personal clerks for uh, drinks and snicky snacks. And then we'd, everybody would go home for uh, Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve or whatever it was, see. But, and that was real nice. Uh, the officers kind of let their guard down then. And, and uh, you still said, sir. But, uh, you know, they would talk to you about other things. See, so it was kind of nice then. So what did you do when you got out of the Marine Corps? Uh, I came back home. I lived with my folks in Gaston. And I commuted back and forth to Ball State and graduated. And I went two solid years and, and uh, three summers. And I graduated. And what year did you get out of the military? 80, 68. So you got out, if I remember correctly, you got out at the beginning of 68, correct? I uh, got out in May. Mm -hmm. So what was the environment here when you got back as far as anti-war movements, assassinations? Well, you know, it really didn't affect me that much. Um, I think a lot of that movement was in the bigger cities. Uh, I didn't experience any of that uh, here going to Ball State or working. Uh, I am, I'm sure there was some of it, but uh, I didn't experience a lot of it on campus. Uh, I didn't see... Uh, well, I know one thing. If I would have saw someone degrading the military, I'd have stopped it. See, But I didn't see much of it on campus at, at that time. And... Uh, I was here every day um, in this building and the building right over here, which used to be the old library, right on the corner there, the first floor was a huge study hall. So, so rather than drive back and forth to Gaston uh, during the day, I'd just come in the morning, get most of my studying done between classes in that, in that large study hall, and then I'd go home. How, how did you feel about people such as John Kerry, who were supposedly Vietnam veterans who came back and protested as veterans. I'll tell you how, he, to me, he's such a stinker, I won't buy Heinz ketchup or Heinz products. I mean, uh, um, the guy was smart in one respect that he planned his life out at an early age knew what he wanted to do, and he cheated in doing it. And thank God the Swift Boat guys came along and wrote a book about it and said, hey, this is not the way it really it was. So uh, I would have felt better if Kerry would have said, yeah, I got my Purple Hearts, and here's how, and here's the record. But when you say that and you don't have any proof for it, something's wrong. So I think is a number one idiot. You're in the meat business right now. Have you been over in Vietnam seeing dead bodies, handling dead bodies, seeing blood and death? Do you think you'd be able to do the job you do right now? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, everyone I've always talked to that's had actual combat fighting, they didn't know how they were going to react uh, in any of their firefights. And so for me to say, yeah, I think I could do it, I don't know. Don't know how I could handle that. Um, I, I do know that uh, we were we were all so brainwashed 
um, you just went along with the, with the, what they told you to do. So um, I'm sure you know that if if I got into a firefight, you you would react and shoot back because that's you were trained to do that. And a side note from that, when we, when I was in the Marine Corps and Jerry Griffith and everyone else, you couldn't just walk away. Uh, in boot camp, they marched you around and said, look, here's a hole in the fence, and here's over here is a hole in the fence. If you leave, we'll pick you up tomorrow, bring you back, and you're going to sit in the brig. Well, today, you can go, uh, I'm almost positive this is true, uh, you can go into boot camp, and if you don't like it, you can walk away, and nothing happens. I assume you get a dishonorable discharge, uh, or a general discharge of some sort, but you sure in hell wouldn't get an honorable discharge. So that's one good thing about the Marines today. Every one of the Marines that are there today in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, wherever, are there because they want to be in the Marine Corps. Otherwise, they could have walked out from boot camp. I don't know. Jerry probably could tell you. I don't know if once you got once you were graduated as a Marine, if you could just up and leave. I would say no. But uh, during boot camp, now I've been told you can. Isn't that something? When I, in my era, you, you didn't. You couldn't possibly do that you'd be in the brig there's a lot of stories about the drug culture in vietnam were you exposed to any drugs uh i on my base none but when we were in after we graduated we were thrown into the second itr training and there were thousands and thousands of troops that were going in through this type of training so we were in barracks that you know, you didn't you didn't know anyone, and you were just by yourself because you were all one big, huge training uh, organization, and that was the first time that I experienced uh, ever people smoking marijuana. See, and they they would do it right on base, and they would huddle next to a wall locker or something. And uh, frankly, I didn't really realize at that time um, just what they were doing, but. Uh, uh, that was the only time I experienced it. On my duty station, uh, not at all. Uh, here again, uh, we all, all of us clerks, uh, were a well oiled uh, group of guys who had to perform a function for all these officers, whether it was in logistics or in supply or in uh, manpower or whatever and you had to look like a DI every day dressed up I mean you had to have super clean clothes all pressed we didn't wear ties because it was hot in Hawaii uh, but you had to look good and um, let me tell you you didn't want to let your superior down so uh, you didn't miss a day's work period you never were late. Um, you might have been drunk the night before, but by God, you got up the next morning and and uh, you were there, whatever time you had to be there at work. Um, it was just something you did. You just didn't question it. I mean, uh, so experience any drugs on 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 the base? I sure in the heck didn't experience any of that. Did you ever get in trouble? Never once. No. And there again. Uh, uh, that I think has a lot to do with my parents. Um, my mom was a disciplinarian. My dad would never say anything to me. But he had a way about him that I knew he would feel so bad if I got in trouble. So never did I get in trouble in high school and sure as hell wouldn't get in trouble in the Marine Corps because one, I was afraid of going into the brig and two, I did not want to let the man I was working for down. See? And uh, so, no, I never got in trouble. None of us guys got in trouble that were clerks. Not one of us. Um, it was just a thing you had to do. See. Looking back in hindsight at the conflict in Vietnam, uh, what's your overall opinion or reaction? It's the same as it is today. We need to take every damn politician, keep his nose out of fighting a war. And let 
the, the generals decide what to do to win the war, get in there, kick their ass, and get out. But we have idiots like John Kerry saying Marines are shooting and raping young kids and women in Iraq. I mean, give me a break. Um, I just cannot see the Marines doing that or Army, anyone doing that in the service. Um, so politi the politicians are the ones that has ruined it for the military to win a war. If it was, if it was, uh, I forget who it was, Westmoreland or someone was the big gun in Vietnam. And I think it was. And, uh, when he announced what he could do to win the war, Johnson pulled him out, I think it was, and no more general over there. And they played games still. You know, I had to pulled everyone out, nuked the damn place, and be done with it. This is what it carry a big stick, and we would be better off today. But we're here again. The politicians, uh, they want to do the thinking for you. I know in uh, Vietnam, uh, my good buddy from high school was there. He said before they could fire on someone, they had to shoot first, your enemy, and then they could return fire. Silly, you know. But the politicians are the ones that have set those parameters, see. And uh, I had a man stop in the store the other day. He remembers me from somewhere. Evidently, when we were in college together or something, he's retired Army colonel. And uh, he had to stop in and say hi. And I don't remember him all at all. And he can't remember where he knows me, but he remembers the name. And uh, I forget where. It must have been uh, Iraq where something came down. They couldn't carry live ammo in their, in their guns in a certain area. And he was saying, that's it. You know, we're not going to go out at all. We're not going to do anything if, if we can't carry live ammo. So here again, uh, you know, you're over there, and you're going to walk around with, as a Marine or as an Army man and not have any have any weapons or have any ammo. Silly. So I would uh, bomb them all big time be done with it, save a million, millions of lives, lots of taxpayers' money, get in there, clean house, and get out. How, how do you feel the veterans returning home from Iraq are being treated today compared to those of Vietnam? Uh, from, what, from what I see, um, I think they're treated a hell of a lot better. And the, and the returning veterans have a little bit more uh, respect now, I think, than what they did from Vietnam. Because here again, politicians entered their nose into the thing, and uh, uh, everything bad that could come out of Vietnam was told nothing good. So therefore, when you come back home, you know, you were all baby killers, and you, mur you, you butchered all these women and everybody else and uh, went on. So, I, you know, I think they're... They're, uh, they have more respect today coming back from Iraq and Iran than they ever did. See. Do you feel like the VA is doing a good job taking care of the Vietnam veterans and how they've announced? Well, that? you know, I don't know. Um, I have to go to the VA to, to get uh, hearing aids, and I don't know how they're going to treat me. But uh, I only know from what I, everyone else reads, you know, that... The building, one building needs a paint job, and, you know, and they got to wait long. I don't know if that's true or false. I know Jerry Griffin will bend over backwards to help a veteran. So uh, long as we have men like him, I feel better. That's really all the questions I have for you. Um, is there anything that I missed or you would like to add that you feel is important that I haven't covered? Well, the only thing I can say about being a Marine um, is one of the, it's the largest fraternity in the world. 
and there's more camaraderie being a Marine than there is being a, a Navy or Army or Air Force. I don't know really why that is, but uh, I, I, in fact, I am going to get uh, a Marine Corps sticker and put it on my front door at work, but I have it on my truck. And people who park come in the meat market and say, well, where's, who's the Marine? So it makes you feel good that, uh, you know, here's old Marines coming and asking, who's, who's the Marine in here? So whenever a Marine sees a Marine, they always make an effort, you know, Semper Fi, buddy. And that makes you feel good, you know, the camaraderie of it. So um, I'm pleased that, uh, that uh, that's still going on as a tradition. Anyway, that's all I've got to say. What, like Forrest Gump or something? Would it be